So if you're just joining us, you'll see the slide up in your light, up on your screen at the moment. Um, this is the workshop on the role of arts and culture in inclusive education. You're very welcome. Just as you arrive, I would just ask that you, if you need access to or want access to the closed captions, you can see the CC live transcript button on the bottom of your screen. You can click on that to open your captions. Um, we are welcoming questions and discussion in the chat box. So for any points you'd like to make or for any questions you'd like to ask, please use the chat box throughout um, the workshop and presentation. Um, and we would ask that people would remain muted. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question, which we would encourage, um, I'm asking people to raise their hands so we can see um, and call people in so we can regulate that. Again, if you're just arriving, you're arriving to the workshop on the role of arts and culture in inclusive education. We've had a fantastic morning so far this morning. Um, for those who need to access their live uh, captions, please click the CC button on the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> We're welcoming comments and questions in the chat box. We'll keep an eye on those throughout um, the session today. And uh, we would ask that people would remain muted. Uh, and if they would like to raise a question or speak or um, have an outburst in some way that you raise your hand first before uh, we would do that. And we can invite people in to speak then. In preparing for the conference, uh, in preparing for the conference and this session today, we agreed that the two speakers uh, would use this time in more a discussion-based approach. Both will present um, for around kind of eight to 10 minutes each at the beginning of the session to tell you about their work in terms of uh, developing pathways for learners and cooperation between further education and higher education in the area of uh, music. Um, this is a project that is based in Ireland um, and we're very lucky to have the two speakers with us today. Again, if you're joining us, just to say that you're very welcome. We would like to focus on this being a discussion-based um, workshop. So the first two presenters will not be presenting PowerPoints. They will be telling the story of the journey. Um, and we would, again, really encourage engagement and discussion in the chat box and conversation. We will then, after the two presenters uh, speak, invite Alexia from Open Door in Greece to come and uh, present to us on the Salzburg uh, Convention of 2015. Um, and Alexia is joining us from the Education Members Forum and she will give a presentation then on the Salzburg Convention. So um, I think we're ready to start going. I'd love if people would write into the chat where they're coming from. Um, maybe just to let us know who is here and who's attending here today, because uh, we'd be able to track that. So please use the chat option to write uh, in where you're coming from and who you are. Again, we might invite you in to speak, and uh, we would love to hear from you throughout today's presentation. So um, first of all, we're welcoming speakers from Munster Technological University based in Cork, Ireland, and also from Cork Education and Training Board, um, which is a Cork Education and Training Board being a further education um, centre, um, and the Munster Technological University. Um, and I'll hand over to Hugh on that because I'm sure both speakers will describe it much better than I will. So I think we'll begin the workshop. You're all very welcome. And I'm going to hand over now to Hugh McCarthy uh, to introduce himself in the first inst instance from Munster Technological University. Thank you, Hugh. Thanks, Owen. Morning, everyone. Um, so as Owen said, my name is Hugh McCarthy and I work in the Munster Technological University 
Cork School of Music. Now, I might wander between the words MTU, Cork School of Music and CIT because we only turned into a university in the last three or four months and I get my abbreviations and acronyms slightly mixed up sometimes. Um, so my position in the Cork School of Music and MTU Cork School of Music is as hmm. uh, primarily as a music technology lecturer. I, um, I coordinate and run a series of programs and courses and modules um, inside the School of Music, primarily in music and technology. And our job usually is to take the idea of technology and take the scariness away from it for people um, for, from the arts. So it's to get musicians and artists into tech without them getting too frightened of it. Um, I'm quite a newcomer to the, the, the idea of inclusive education. And I suppose from my perspective, it really began as a collaboration. Um, about two years ago, uh, I received a call from a group in Dublin, the uh, Royal Irish Academy of Music, who wanted to form what they were calling the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland. And this was a large collaboration in that it was it was being an all Ireland um, inclusive situation where we're not only taking from the Republic of Ireland, but from Northern Ireland as well. So there were going to be four higher education institutions involved in this. And we were going to come together uh, every couple of months as a group with small ensemble groups from each of these colleges. So my first reaction was this is fantastic but i don't know anything about this type of work um i know quite a lot about music technology but the kind of people who would be involved in working on this project i really didn't know so at that point i actually contacted owen because i had worked with owen going back maybe 15 20 years on and off in a variety of uh, guises and uh i asked him to come in and advise and uh, it, it worked out very well and in the end of the day, we went to this Open Youth Orchestra. We had an ensemble in Cork. We worked with them. We brought them to the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland. It was a really an eye-opening experience for me. Um, not, and I think our, our our participants from Cork, our ensemble from Cork, really enjoyed it as well. And we're still working with them, Owen and myself, and another staff member from School of Music in Cork as well. One of the big takeaways, I think, and this was the reflection on this um, that this Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland project was. Uh, I come from a music background, I come from a classical music background, I come from an orchestral background. And I was curious about this, first of all, this idea of open and inclusive. Um, but I was also curious about what is the takeaway for people from this. And from my perspective as an educator in higher education, um, I always find that the reward for working in these things is the credits you get, the marks you get, you get a parchment, a piece of paper at the end of the day. And I was curious as to why the First of all, the participants in the Open Youth Orchestra Ireland don't get a parchment or participation or credits like other people who would be partaking in higher education would. And the second part for me was when we were talking about inclusive and open, um, I was, I suppose, I, I expected that there would be lots of people from the mainstream, uh, mainstream education involved as well. And there, there wasn't, it was, it was lots of people, um, participants who had disabilities and the only people who were from the mainstream were really their um, teachers and we played with them but there was no peer age group from the mainstream so I kind of set about looking at was there a way to, to actually address this and this led to a project called Tempo I uh, technology enhanced music performance open and inclusive so the purpose of Tempo I was to investigate could we have inclusive pathways in higher education for people with disabilities. Um, and the idea was to basically bring people together in a, another music ensemble, but to bring people from all walks of life, regardless of disability or ability. Um, so uh, the current practice in Ireland that I found when looking at this and investigating this in higher education, there, there is lots of inclusive work going on. It's, it's really, really heartening to see but it tends to be around advocacy courses and skills for living courses and no discipline specific courses and very few of these programs have credit college credit or um, school credit involved in them so our plan in the tempo i project was to bring together this ensemble and in doing so to give proper credit as it would be in college so how are we going to do it um so we have got in the pipes at the moment a suite of 
modules or courses that are all going to work together. So at level eight, that's our final year of college, we have a, a set of modules, two mo actually needs to become one long module to make sure that people who are interested can stay on board for the whole year and spread it out. And they'll get into a room with people from level six, which would be first year standard of college and people from sub level six, which would be beneath the college level, the college bar level. OK. Um, and what we're going to have happen in this room is that they're going to all play in a music ensemble together for two hours a week. They will learn about the technology that is there. They will learn about each other. And within this space, they will also have to engage each other. And I think that was the biggest thing for us when I, when we were talking about it and when I was researching this, that there is it's, it's more about it's not all about the music technology. It's more about normalizing the space for everybody involved so that people in college experience what it's like to work with people with disabilities, but people with disabilities also get to work within the college space. Um, the idea in the, the, the level eight modules is going to be offered to people who are already in a mainstream college program. The level six first year college level program, um, it's potentially written that anybody at college level could take it, but in the first instance, it's going to be offered to people with disabilities as we trial run it. We need to test run this and um, they will get credit for this. We're developing it simultaneously, a special purpose award, which is a certificate if you do a certain amount of credits at level six. Where the, I suppose, the next set of um, collaborations come in is at uh, sub level six, where we in the college level in higher education, and it was unequivocally no, I was told to this, I wanted to get accreditation at sub level six, and I was unequivocally told no. And taking a look around the landscape and trying to find partners for this, all roads eventually led back to the Cork ETB, which Jer will talk about in a minute. Um, Within this space, there's going to be quite a few teachers, um, so it is quite an expensive program in that sense that there will be the, the teacher to student ratio will be very, very high. There will be a music technology specialist, there will be an inclusive education specialist, and there will be a comp composer and musician who has experience working with alternative means of composition and uh, working with different people from different walks of life and different experiences of music and the arts. Um, again, none of those three college level lecturers would have experience, real experience, working in inclusion and working with people with disabilities. Um, so where we're at at the moment is that we have gotten our programs at college level approved. We have engaged with the ETB to try and bring in sub level six programs and we're trying to get a formal agreement together between higher education and the, the MTU and the Cork Education Training Board. This whole thing has been delayed a little because this year we were supposed to be trialing and piloting a variety of means of working with students in this situation. So instead of having a trial run at it and then starting up the modules and the courses, we're just gonna dive right in in September because due to COVID and we have tried this online, it doesn't work. Music ensembles with people don't particularly work at all. <laughs> On, on Zoom, if we've, had, we've had some interesting experiences over the last few weeks, trying it out with um, some of our people from the, the Open Youth Orchestra of Ireland Ensemble. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a learning curve in itself to try and make music happen in a, an environment where we can't have real time interaction and let alone then if everybody has pieces of technology, we can't help them with it directly. We're trying to hold it up to the screen and point at things as opposed to being able to sit down next to somebody and help them out. Uh, so yes, this, that's where we're at. We have, we have just the cusp of a, a formal agreement with the Cork ETB, the Cork Education, Education and Training Board. And what we're hoping to do in September is to start this run of a two hour ensemble per week where everybody from all levels gathers together in a, it's quite like a traditional orchestral training situation. And each of those groups, then the level eight, the level six, and the sub level six would have an hour outside of this ensemble where they would learn at the level specific to their educational needs um, about 
music, music technology, and inclusive um, and uh, disability policies. And at that point, I can hand you over to Ger to let her, let her have her talk a little bit about what the Cork ETB are doing. Thanks very much, Hugh. Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody is well. Um, as, as my colleagues around me know, I'm just uh, in, back from a little holiday where uh, I've been in the cold sea every morning for the last few mornings and uh, listening to music and, and looking at scenery. So my, my health and well-being at the moment is, is top class. And I suppose um, I'm somebody, though I work with Cork ETB as an adult education officer, my background is in the arts. Uh, I trained as an actress and uh, did my BA in, in drama and theatre studies. So that's the context of where I'm coming from, really. And before I joined the ETBs, I worked for um, 18 years with people with varying degrees of ability in um, a residential center which thankfully i suppose we don't have too many of in, in this country anymore except we're really necessary that we're far more inclusive of people now though still not inclusive enough and do i believe in uh, the arts in being i suppose the catalyst for uh, for creating further inclusion yes absolutely and definitely um so cork education and training board is one of 16 education and training boards in this country now. Um, like Hugh, who is currently going through transition, we went through that transition about five years ago. And um, sorry to tell you, Hugh, but uh, we're still transitioning. <laughs> it doesn't get any easier. But nonetheless, um, so notwithstanding Cork ETB's, I suppose, strong focus on education in the formal sector, it has a long legacy of supporting community learning across Cork City and County. And the Cork ETB would support education in many domains and is committed to strongly to inclusion. Uh, our mission is to provide a pathway for every learner and in doing so it aims to meet people where they are at both physically and metaphorically. Um, CETB offers learners a comprehensive and responsive curricular experience including languages, the humanities, arts, technologies, and science. And our aim is to deliver high quality, appropriate, and relevant education and training programs in a variety of environments and settings, where high quality teaching and learning are at the center of those activities. And we like to think that we promote a culture of growth and development in which our learners are encouraged to give full expression to all their talents and gifts. And I suppose when, when Owen contacted me first about this project, which is huge, huge project, I was very excited and thought, okay, this is something that really, really sits well with Cork Education and Training Board. It's actually what we're about. And it couldn't have come at a better time for us because we're just about developing our new strategy for 22 to 26 the Cork Education and Training Board strategy. And within that, I'm delighted to say we're going to develop an art strategy for the entire ETB. Because up to now, what we had was probably an arts in education policy and an arts education policy. The arts education being that that's based on a curriculum and the arts in education was far more based through the community and evolved from the community. So now we're going to let both of them work hand in hand and provide an overall Cork Education and Training Board strategy. So we have been involved in other uh, partnerships and in other collaborations up to now. And one of them was through the Arts for All project. And this is where I got to know Owen first and where we believe within Cork City that the arts should be available to everybody, that nothing should be a barrier, that you should be able to participate in and watch and have them accessible at all levels. So within the Arts for All, uh, over the last number of years, we've been trying to develop that and give everybody a sense of being involved and being able to be involved. So we conducted a small pilot project in 2019 where we looked at the benefits of uh, arts participation for people. 
And I suppose what we found from it was, and it, we, what we did was we had groups involved in drama and music, and the programs were accessible to everybody, regardless of ability. And the research showed us that involvement in the arts enabled learners to express their emotions, first of all, which in turn promoted higher levels of self-esteem and competence, which also helped develop their capacity for decision-making, which then allowed them even to move on to other programs to develop their confidence and their skills further. So there was no doubt in our minds after that, the research was conducted by a student from UCC and it left us in no doubt really that we needed to continue to promote the arts further and to develop further um, collaborations. Equally, when we started to review our current policies around the arts, one of the strategies that we have identified as one we need to develop is breaking down the barriers. We need to challenge the barriers that currently exist around access and participation. And anything that will help us do that is welcome. So this is, this is where this MTU project came as well, which was really, as I said, very opportune for us at the time. So how did it come about and how did it happen? So I suppose I'd like to break it down into, in, into three different things for me, just, just very, very briefly, communication, collaboration and partnership. And I think too often, uh, certainly in our country, I don't know about the rest of you, we tend to wait all the time to be dictated to by the powers that be and by hierarchy. Whereas I have to say, I'm a huge believer in building from the ground up. So what this project took was for Hugh McCarthy to have an idea, to discuss it with Owen Nash, and then to decide we actually can't finalize it on our own we need to involve somebody else and to talk to Ger Canning on behalf of Cork Education and Training Board. So it was us getting together then and believing in the project and believing what could come from it and believing in the benefits the students could gain from it that brought us to this point. So it was the communication initially by these three people on behalf of their organizations. Then it was to go about setting up that collaboration so how do we collaborate? What do you want from me? What, what can we give to you? How can we share? How can we, as Owen said this morning, or somebody said this morning, how can we live together? So this is showing how we can live together. MTU, Arts for All, Cope Foundation, Cork ETB, through, through the minds and spirit of, of people. And then once we've decided to collaborate, and we've all agreed that the collaboration will be wonderful, um, Hugh has explained to you what he can give around, what MTU can give around the, the modules at the higher level. And then I come in and, and I'm trying to say, well, yeah, we can, we can develop our modules at levels two, three, and four. We can offer certification at that level, which will in, allow people to get involved with their peers in a way that they could never have got involved in before, to actually attend a college to sit side by side with somebody who's performing and maybe they're not achieving the academic standard, but they're having the same experience. So we can then allow them at their pace to achieve certification at the lower levels of two, three and four. Equally, we can provide literacy support and numeracy support to those people engaged in the project that may need it. And we can provide the staff to do that and the students will again benefit. So we've had the communication, the collaboration. Now we see where the partnership is going. And we're waiting, as Hugh said, for the final tick boxes from the powers that be to say, yes, this is a project. Because certainly, our, I know our chief executive is very much behind it and very much wants it to move forward. And I understand he sits on the board of MTU, so he will be flying the flag at that level as well. And that's where the partnership comes in. At that point then, we will develop what we call a memorandum of understanding between the two organizations, and that will really seal the deal. But will it? It really won't. <laughs> we'll be waiting until September, until our tutors and teachers and practitioners get involved in this 
and I suppose grasp it with the same enthusiasm that that Owen and Hugh and dare I say myself have had up to now in, in, in getting the project to where it is. So look, it, it, for any of you that are out there that want to start thinking about developing something like this and, and wondering how to get about, just get up and do it. Just get the idea, foster the idea, nurture the idea and speak to like-minded people who, who can be game changers, who have the enthusiasm for it, who believe in inclusion and who believe that the arts is the, 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 the mode by which we can get people. We need to go on the arts journey in order for people to feel inclusive. And hopefully that next year, if, if we're back speaking with you, these people will have graduated with their certificates at whatever level, but they will all have attended the same program. They will all have had the same experience and they will all graduate on the same day. And that is inclusion at its very best. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ger, and thank you, Hugh. Um, I just want to say again, we would like to be able to bring people in and out to discuss this. I can see that there's a range of people have indicated where they're coming from. So we have Anne from Belgium, Nora from Hungary, uh, Helen from Cork, Helena from Stockholm, uh, Adriana, originally from R Romania, living in Germany, Charlotte from uh, the UK. And I'm really keen to see what others, maybe just to start fostering your own questions. Um, and we would love to invite people in to hear. This project, of course, is an emerging project. It's not an established project at this stage. And I suppose that was the purpose of this presentation to share with you the journey where, you know, concepts, ideas that start small and through partnership, cooperation and through shared kind of passions are, can be enabled um, through relationship building and then through um, formalizing those with kind of organizational kind of structures as well. Um, we're going to continue now uh, and before we go to kind of open up the floor, and I would ask you to start maybe getting your questions ready and uh, to see if we can invite people in. I'd like to hand you over now to a member of the Education uh, Committee, Alexia from Open Door in Greece, who's going to give us a presentation on the Salzburg Declaration 2015. So, um, before we go any further and before we go to questions and reflections, over to you, Alexia, please. Thank you, Owen, very much. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here with you. Um, okay. So, so the ESPD's member forum on education uh, is currently developing a new declaration on inclusive education, building on from their 2015 Salzburg Declaration, and you can find the full document in the page of this workshop. Um, the declaration aims to raise awareness of the importance of inclusive learning environments and identify the key barriers to inclusive education and provide recommendations to policymakers and professionals in the field of education. Also, the declaration will build on ESPD's recent barometer report on the state of inclusive education in Europe. Now, the term inclusive learning environments involves an inclusive education system that changes to adapt and welcome every learner who will be welcomed, valued, and will be able to contribute to the learning environment. Inclusive education providers adapt the learning environment to the individual needs of the student and adopt attitudes, approaches, and strategies that include all learners in all activities with respect to their individual learning level. Inclusive learning environments do not only refer to school systems, but also to all levels of education in the human life course, for example, preschool services, vocational, education and training and so on. So the key topics to be addressed in the declaration include the current legal and political framework, such as the UNCRPD, the Salamanca Statement, the European Disability Strategy, 
also the European education area, the European pillar of social rights and the child guarantee, and the United Nations 2030 agenda. Of course, COVID-19 and its impact on education, the digital transition, and the role of education in an inclusive society. So basically looking at key transitions in every person's life. Now, some of the barriers uh, to inclusive education involve all the following, like the need for an increased awareness of the educational potential and the rights of persons with disabilities in the dimension of inclusive education. The need for a systemic modification of attitude and approach in the education system, the lack of political will for inclusion in most countries, the continued prevalence of two systems, the inclusive one and the segregated one, accessibility issues, uh, both physical and when it comes to e-learning environment, use and knowledge of assistive technology to support inclusion, the availability of appropriate training for teachers and school staff, access to additional support in mainstream educational settings, the need to harmonize definitions of disability in the EU, and the need for data collection on state of inclusion, and siloed working of stakeholders and lack of cooperation. Now, when it comes to ESPD recommendations for the declaration, the declaration will address commitments of ESPD, European policymakers, national and regional policymakers, education providers, and of course, teachers, trainers, and staff. More specifically, uh, when it comes to ESPD, uh, it would provide information uh, models of good practices and support to member organizations organize and promote the necessary trainings on inclusive education, promote positive attitudes towards inclusion, diversity, partnership, and network opportunities. Now, regarding European policymakers, it's about allocation of sufficient financial support for mainstream education settings to provide inclusive environments, including teacher training, and the promotion of the establishment and coordination of inclusive regional learning networks. National and regional policymakers uh, would include training on inclusive education in the teacher training system, would adapt standards to allow the development of curricula with a universal design, and would redefine school achievements and assessment methods for a more flexible system. Education providers should invest in adequate education and training for teachers and staff should strengthen the awareness of local community actors about the importance of inclusive teaching, should establish a clear vision on inclusive education and make sure it is shared by all levels of staff, and should implement the universal design concept in the infrastructure and curricula. And when it comes to teachers, trainers, and staff, we're talking about transferring of good practices among teachers, educators, and other training professionals, and using innovative uh, learning methods and technology to implement teaching methods with a universal design. Now, as we can see, the declaration doesn't really mention anything specific that links inclusive education to arts and culture. It's quite broad on that matter, so ESPD is now looking for more uh, targeted recommendations, and this is uh, why the discussion is really needed today. Thank you very much, Alexia, for that presentation. <clears throat> Good. So um, we have our presenters now all after presenting. Um, I would love to open up to the floor and um, before we do, I just want to uh, put out some provocations and maybe um, some questions that people might respond to. Um, I think Tony Booth, you know, his uh, presentation this morning and his, his own provocations about it, inclusive living were really interesting in, in this morning sessions, asking the question, how do we live together? Just at its most basic and fundamental, like, our, and then how do we achieve this? Where do arts and culture play their part in terms of um, living together? 
The other questions I was thinking about is where does education happen? So if we're talking about creativity and uh, creative education in arts and culture, where can those educational opportunities occur? And are they accessible to the people that we're advocating for, working with, uh, and um, supporting to ensure that we implement the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities? In one of the Salzburg Declaration points there, it talks about systemic modification, attitudes and approaches. And it's interesting to think about that from one, a disability perspective. But I think in terms of arts and culture, it in of itself also finds itself outside the norms and um, typical uh, areas for educational development. Arts and, arts and culture are often misunderstood, underrepresented, often find themselves on the marginalized areas of curriculum implementation, undervalued in terms of their potential. And I think what we have then in terms of uh, the implementation of educational opp opportunities within arts and culture is that those within the arts and cultural sector hand over responsibility for issues on disability to the disability sector and the disability sector finds itself in a position where they may, might not understand or um, support or recognize the importance of arts and culture and then it what it occurs to me happens is we end up in this cycle where arts and culture education and disability where in that meeting place falls between two stools and ends up under invested in uh, it's somebody else's job to do it or to realize the potential and i think that's why this project is such um such a good uh, example of emerging practices and i know there's very well established uh, um, opportunities for people in different nation states but in Ireland I know that this is a good example and I'm sure for others maybe an example of hope um, but I, I did notice and I don't know if you can uh, feel the question Charlotte uh, Perkins there with Opera North in Leeds I'm not sure if you're in a position to hear me there Charlotte you're looking at um, oh, yeah. a harmony uh, the In Harmony Inclusive Music Education Program for Opera North and I'd be really interested to just invite you in at this point because I saw you come up in the chat just to see where you guys are at in the UK in terms of uh, work on this. Um, oh, good question. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can speak on behalf of the whole UK, the whole of the UK. Um, but I'm really happy to tell you what we do at Opera North. I've, I found it so interesting to hear. Um, I'll just put my video on. Hello. Um, so interesting to hear everything that's going on in, in um, Cork. I've, just, I've really enjoyed this discussion so far. Um, in terms of in harmony, if, um, probably uh, most people won't have heard of this program, but um, there are six programs um, that are Arts Council and Department for Education um, funded in England um, that are inclusive music education program. And, and the one that is run by Opera North is based in Leeds in the Northeast. Um, we work with over 1800 young people across the city um, in, uh, in areas where um, there's high socioeconomic economic disadvantage. Um, and uh, we work with every pupil in, in the school that we work in. Um, and in all of these schools, there um, is a huge amount of diversity, um, especially around the special educational needs and disabilities um, area um, and so it's a it's a sort of it, it's an inclusive music education program in that we work with every people in the school they do um, from key stage two upwards they do uh, three sessions of music a week every people has an instrument um, so it's a very sort of transformative program for any primary school that works and um, that, that takes on the program um, and we have to recognize that you know not that that um, our sort of teaching and um uh yeah that that um it, we need to adapt to to the people that um that, that we're teaching 
Yeah, um, one of the key points is that adapting to people coming in and ensuring that that it's things can be universally accessible to people. You know. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, I mean, I suppose coming back to the speakers then as well, from your experience politically, this is on it, and I know that there's probably other things, but is there any kind of things that came up for you in terms of the speakers? I know, Jer, you have to leave attentive for another presentation, um, but maybe like from your point of view, is there any kind of curiosities, outbursts or interests that you have in relation to the two speakers as an emerging, um, as an emerging piece of work happening in Ireland. Is there any queries or questions that you might have for them? That's to you, Charlotte, just because. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I thought you were speaking to Jo. Um, yeah, I think I, I was really interested to hear, um, you know, that communication, collaboration and partnership are key. And um, I just, uh, I completely agree with that and um it's not it's not always really easy I think I think um and especially uh when it comes down to partnership I um I don't know about your experiences but I've really found that um both parties or all parties that are involved need to have um the same amount of risk involved or they need to everybody needs to feel the same uh, sort of weight of the issue um, and I wondered if that's that was something that was your experience or whether you'd had any experiences of sort of wanting to work in partnership with a body that were sort of a bit more like touch than you were feeling and how you sort of got around those issues. OK, well, I might pass that directly back to Jer first and then over to Hugh. So, Jer, do you want to come back on that? Just. Um... Um, hi, Charlotte. Good. good hi. Uh, I suppose it, it, it's, it's about. <laughs> It's about finding the individuals first that can connect. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. I, I think if you can get connection between the people uh, initially before it gets to the organization level. I know it has to end up at the organization level, but if, if the people that have been involved initially in developing it, and I would say as well, prepare, prepare, prepare. Be well prepared before you start bringing in you know other people because the, the better prepared you are then the you know the better chance you have of moving it forward it, it, it's about that initial engagement it's about finding the right people at the right time and and allowing those people to work closely together and building up trust once the trust is there then I, I think it doesn't matter and I have found certainly in a lot of the collaborations and partnerships we've done through the years that sometimes we lead and sometimes we follow and that's okay. It, 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 we don't all have to be, and in, in this one we're following. You know, I said that to Hugh this morning. It, it's, it's his project, it was his idea, and we're so delighted to be involved in collaborating on it and forming the partnership. So I think you have to find some, you have to find groups of people that, that are happy to do that. That would be my top and safe name on it. <laughs> Hugh, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I, I think when it came to, to finding a partnership and finding a collaborator, I, for me, it was it was about the prep work. It was about finding out what's out there already and particularly at third level and and then finding that it was completely impossible to bring in people below higher education um, uh, into higher education um, and, and then trying to find the partners that would possibly enable this to mm. happen. Um, it was it's also interesting even internally within my own institution within my own college i'm still finding pockets of people who are involved in inclusive education i'm I literally last week i went oh this person exists how did i not find this person in my own institution and being able to talk to that person about what they're doing and try and avoid crossover where we clash and prefer to have crossover where we actually end up collaborating um mm -hmm. and it's, it's quite amazing to me that there isn't when we're talking about inclusive education, that there isn't, uh, there doesn't seem to be a cohesive action in the, in the all the pockets I've found. And it's only starting to happen in the last few years. There is mm. a even in Ireland, there's a the inclusive natural national higher education forum, which has only existed for a few years, and it is again pockets of people from a variety of higher education uh, institutions coming together, trying to actually form, I suppose, a steering group. Mm -hmm. To, to enable this kind of work to be done. And I think definitely about prep and then communication. 
And I think that's really key, you know, because internally, again, it comes back to the politics and the kind of weight. I think uh, you mentioned there, Charlotte, the weight of responsibility for others and maybe people, you know, certain institutions um, in their up to date, maybe haven't uh, explored or encouraged or maybe don't see that as their space. And I think that comes back to the communication, because the reality is now with the everyone signing up to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, and um, the new European Disability Rights Strategy, um, you know, this work is going on for a, a long, long time, but the implementation of work within institutions is very slow and can be hard won. And I think that's one of the key things that we're learning um, that where we can build allies and um, connect people, I think we can build strength in those kind of strength in those circumstances. And this project again shows that not everybody can deliver the same thing, but by connecting kind of different groupings together, they can they can deliver the vision. But maybe an individual organisation on their own can't uh, implement it. And I think we we are having difficulties in terms of implementation, although you know, the rights-based approach is there. Um, we need to strengthen that. We need to challenge systems that are, uh, you know, entrenched in their belief systems, challenge those systems and look for our allies uh, across the spectrum that can create that change and constantly plug towards those um, ideas. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Cork currently has um, an an, an alliance of individuals and organizations uh, under the banner of Arts for All, which is connecting people to address these areas in performance-based work, uh, accessibility within the arts structure, arts and education. And this is where these relationships, this relationship-based work can then connect with each other and allow people to um, forward ideas together. Okay. Can I, is there, can I invite any other speakers or questions from the floor? Please raise your hand. Um, I'm just looking through the chat box here. If there's anybody who would like to ask a question, um, I know we have around 10 minutes uh, remaining in our time and we need to show a short video at the end. So is there any other outbursts, interventions or queries to our speakers? on any of what was presented here today, um, you're very welcome to bring them in. Um, Nora, I know you're there in Hungary. Um, can you hear me? Are you there? Yes, I am here. Hello. Good. And I know that you're very active in terms of inclusive choir making and uh, inclusive singing. Is there any particular kind of observations or kind of work that you're doing that you might wish to share with us or ask the speakers today? Um, this year was re really hard for us uh, because of the COVID-19, so, so I can say a lot uh, about it. Uh, I can speak about this choir. Uh, we made it with the Never Give Up Foundation and we work here uh, uh, with people with uh, disabilities and everybody can join if they want. Um, so I can say that uh, it's not it's a non-formal non-formal choir. So it's not a school. It's a it's a play. It's a place where people with disabilities can use their free time usefully. So and I can say my experience that it gives uh, so much joy for these people. So so I think the art activities is really important uh, for their lives. And uh, I'm a member of an integrated band also, where uh, people with disabilities uh, are working, so it's their official work. And, uh, and I, I can just say that it's, it's really important part of this life, the art activities. So, so I, I, I think it would be really important to build it into the educational life because everybody can can find uh, the talent themselves and and so so it's really great i think it's really <laughs> interesting that we you know hear directly from uh, people certainly who access our service the importance of arts and culture in their in their lives and through our person centered planning approaches constantly hear about the importance of 
music, I want to dance, I want to play music, I want to be a painter. Um, and these come across in per person-centered plannings. But yet we still have a serious lack of educational opportunities to support people to navigate through to those employment opportunities. And we in uh, social service providers and the service provider sector are really relying on people beyond our expertise to support us with those educational pathways. And again, this project gives us that opportunity to see how that cooperation um, that cooperation can lead to those improved opportunities. And I think that's really one of the key messages that needs to come around, that we can't uh, implement Article 30 of the UN Convention uh, and Article 24 alone. We need this cooperative approach where social services, where educators, where persons with disabilities leading um, and identifying what they want for their futures and informing us how we can develop services and educational pathways and including the voice and um, the voices of those who want to access those supports in that decision making and developmental processes. Um, Jur, if you're still there, I don't know if you are still there or not because I know you said you had to leave. In terms of including the voices of um, people in work, I know you mentioned your study there earlier. That was. Uh, is there any more work that you're doing in ensuring that um, the voices of people are included in developing strategies going forward? Maybe Jura is gone. I know she had said to me. She's gone, Owen. Is she gone? So maybe can I bring that to you, Hugh, in terms of um, including the voices? Do you see that being important and what kind oh. of role um, people with disabilities have had in terms, have you maybe met other people who are working in this area, who identify as disabled artists in informing your uh, research in the development of these programs? In the higher education landscape, not so much. That's, I mean, I suppose that's one of the things that I, I've set out with this project to address is that we, we kind of want to encourage people. And that's what the level six modules would be for, is to bring people with disabilities into the higher education landscape to actually, I suppose, inform us. And that's, I suppose that's the terrifying part about next September is that we won't have done this before it hasn't been done before and i can see and the modules that the things that the things that we've written um and the, the shape of the course i can see them we've left them quite loose because i can see them being severely changed over the course of the year as we work with people in the room and it will it's working with me i mean they are students but the, it'll be very much a collaborative process to figure out how to shape this kind of program for the future and i think one of the things that was striking me there is as you were talking about um, the undervaluing of the arts and culture, um, the funding that we received for this project, when we got it in the Cork School of Music, we all went, yes. Uh, and I'm currently sitting on a, a research board uh, and forming a, a research group at the moment where one of the people that we've brought on board works in a, a very scientific environment. And when we compare the funding that they get for their work versus the funding that we get for our work, we start to cry a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's unbelievable. And I think that's one another, the, the next form of collaboration I'm looking at in terms of this is that, so we're looking at people with developing instruments or developing an orchestra for people with, or an ensemble for people with disabilities, an inclusive ensemble. Um, but we need to look at, start looking at how we can develop particular instruments. And this can get into engineering and the sciences um, VR, XR, and suddenly if we can couch and frame this conversation the right way around, we can get the science people on board and they will start writing funding applications for us in their stream. Um, it's and funny it's that again, we almost have to alter ourselves and our career paths in arts and culture to fit it into other logical means for it to make sense to people, that it isn't, in, it isn't kind of almost recognize that arts and culture are that valued in its own right in in a monetary situation and i think that is you know that's an ongoing thing so in a way i kind of see it's almost doubly marginalized one by often the segregation that people with disabilities find themselves in terms of accessing opportunities for arts and cultural educational opportunities but also arts and education or arts uh, and culture opportunities within uh, main uh, within broader education things find themselves almost marginalized within that system again but again just coming back to the voice of 
disabled artists and, um, you know, in the development of modules or anything like that, have you discussed with, um, you know, disabled activists or disabled artists, how they might uh, encourage your work, you know, as, as a newcomer to the area? Um, so when we're getting the modules made, we have to put them through a validation process. Um, and we usually have to, what the, the, the standard process is that there should be one academic validator and one uh, industrial uh, validator. And on this project, it really wasn't about finding, I suppose, it wasn't about finding music experts. Uh, well, there's plenty of them knocking around. Uh, it was about finding people about with inclusion, um, inclusion education and inclusive practice uh, expertise. So the academic person was simply someone from uh, another college in Ireland who works in the humanities and has worked with inclusive programs before. But more interestingly for me, and I think this was a quite a lot of looking around, <coughs> excuse me, to find people. Um, they, both Simon McKeown and Tara Brandel were fantastic, I have to say. Uh, just the conversations alone about inclusive practice within the arts were amazing, that the, the ideas and it, it really takes the focus off, actually, the art practice in itself. It's not about the education in the arts. It's about how we can bring people in and share this level of learning and this level, I suppose, of enjoyment, actually. It's, it's, what, it's the rewards you take away from it, being involved in the arts, and the rewards that it should be there for everybody to take away from it. So um, I know um, say Simon is um, a visual artist based in the UK who identifies as disabled, and Tara Brandel... Um, a dancer in West Cork. A, a dancer, um, again, uh, working in the space. So I think that's key as well as including the voice of disabled artists in the development of kind of, of work going forward. And I think that, you know, it's part of any developing um, projects that we ensure that we're talking to the people that we're working with and through so that, uh, that their voices are part of the processes. I'm aware, guys, that it's now 12 o'clock. Um, I just want to, is there any kind of final remarks you want to make you before we close off this? Just to thank you, Jor uh, and Alexia for your presentations. I know we just have a short slide to show as well in video. Is there any last remarks that you'd like to make you? Yeah, aside from saying thank you to everybody. Um, it's, I suppose, I, I, I'm just wondering, are, are people open to being contacted directly about the project, looking for advice, looking for help, looking for collaborations? Um, I would like to, at some point, possibly, the whole idea of this program is that it's, I suppose, not just reserved to the music niche, it's to try and build a model of how we can do this at higher education across a variety of disciplines. So it's not just music, it could be arts, it could be maths, it could be sciences, it could be social, uh, social, uh, the social sciences. And I'm just kind of curious if people kind of open just to general contact. Can we do that um, through Sydney? Um, I know Sydney is the facilitator for the Arts and Culture Members Forum with EASPD. And that it may be if people have uh, questions or further follow-ups. I mean, I think it's really interesting to see maybe in the future, once it's established, that uh, maybe people from different countries can come and study at the Cork School of Music and, um, you know, as part of this programme and learn, learn, learn through this, you know, that people from all over Europe can come and be part of that process as well. So Sydney, do you think that's something that we could facilitate um, any follow-up questions that could come through uh, the office in the ASPD? Absolutely, people uh, can contact me, people that are not in our member forum, and even for our member forum, which is, which is quite large. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have all of them here today, but we have lots of people in our member forum that I'm sure would be super interested in and hearing about this and taking part and we could even invite uh, you to uh, and uh, to talk about this maybe in one of our uh, meetings further down the line so. fantastic okay so um if we can we might bring today's uh, presentations to a close just to thank everybody for coming before we finish we just have a quick slide from sydney um just to remind people that the conference continues tomorrow um, it begins at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Brussels time with an energizer and warmer. So when you get out of bed in the morning, you can stumble to your office, which is probably two feet away from your bed. If you're like in Ireland, still working remotely as a result of COVID, begin your energizer. And of course, we have a range of speakers that will continue expert speakers and workshops tomorrow. 
and we will continue uh, with all of that work uh, as well. So thank you so much, Hugh. Thank you, Jar. Thank you, Alexia. And thank you to the facilitators or captioners and to you, Sydney, facilitating um, the setting up of this. And again, Rachel as well for all of your work. Thank you for the interventions from the floor. I'm not sure if you want to put up that slide. Um, we're not seeing it at the moment, Sydney, but please put it up. And again, to remind everybody that the conference continues tomorrow. And thank you so much for your involvement and engagement at today's uh, session on arts, culture and pathways for music, inclusive music education.